Willow, episode 4 review, the only show that cares less about giving the fans what they want than James Gunn. We start at the end of the cliffhanger from the last episode of Bav Morda, the sorcerer's castle from the first movie, something which I'd forgotten about at the time, but they do tell you. This fortress was the stronghold of the most brutal tyrant of her age, Bav Morda. Or as Kit calls her, Grandma. Would have been nice to know that before, wouldn't it? Before they did a cliffhanger where it's Bav Morda and everyone just went, what? I don't know names from the best of times, but I don't know if you realised, Willow was a movie from the 80s. You gotta expect us to remember every place. And besides, it doesn't exactly look like it did from the movie, does it? Now the question on my mind is, how did the castle get more evil without the evil sorceress in it? And don't worry, they're never going to answer that. Just don't think about it, it'll be fine. So they walk to the castle through the rain, and you know, here's Willow, a powerful sorceress, the hero leading our mighty party. I'm sure he's not going to struggle with a beat of flat terrain. <laughs> oh no, maybe he's just gonna collapse because it rained on him a bit. Seriously, dude, what are you, the Wicked Witch of the West? We can't go in! I'm melting! There's more. It won't be easy to hear this, but you must. That's basically my internal monologue every time a new episode appears. But what follows is an episode full of flashbacks exploring the evil castle, and it really tries to pull on those nostalgia heartstrings. Kit has made her husband kneel and handcuffed him to the floor. I think from their previous interactions, we could have worked out that their marriage would end this way. I just didn't expect it this fast, to be honest. Look, I know he can be an arse, but don't you think a hot poker's taking it a bit far, mate? Unless you think that'll help he was possessed by a warm stick, and so I'm going to save him with a warm stick. Sorry about this, pal. What are you doing that for? Are you actually melting the shackles together because you don't have the key? How are you going to get him out of it if you don't have the key? We successfully locked you in, but now the only way out is to cut your hand off because we melted the metal together. <laughs> oh, and if you're wondering what the solution to that will be, don't bother. It's just like the previous episodes where we write ourselves into a narrative corner that doesn't have an answer, and so we just don't give you one. We cut to another scene, and then the problem is solved. On the one hand, at least they realised it was an issue. On the other, they don't even care enough to try and explain it to you. What do you think she used these for? Probably the same thing as your wife. Or maybe because she was an evil sorceress that went around kidnapping loads of people, she needed a ray to keep them there. It's not rocket science. But more than you had a romp. Legendary parties, three, four days in a row. Oh, so we're back to the wife then, are we? <laughs> but the kid realises his fate and tries to prepare them for the worst. What happened to Ballantyne and Merrick is gonna happen to me. And you guys are gonna have to stop me before I... You're gonna have to kill me before I kill all of you. Now, you would expect this to have some kind of emotional impact on the group. Oh, no, we're not gonna do that. Don't worry we'll find a solution to try and calm him down. Everyone acts like a normal human being. Except this is Willow, so they're not human beings. What? What was Ballantyne gonna do to me? How does that follow on from what he was saying? How is this about you? Much like a zombie, you might have to cure the problem before I take it all out on you. And she's like, my spidey sense is tingling. I think someone's trying to take attention away from me. What was the guy trying to do to me? Ignore him, he's just dying over there anyway, it doesn't matter. What Bav Morda started when you were a baby? She should already know that anyway, she remembers basically everything else from when she was a baby. Why not the actual main event of the show? The ritual of the 13th night, banishing your soul to a realm of perpetual suffering. Oh, they were gonna send you to Birmingham. Sends a chill down your spine. But the kid goes through the events of the last movie, except rewritten throughout history, as now Willow was a mighty sorcerer who smited her with his magics, rather than the disappearing pig trick. Doesn't exactly lead to the same heroic tale. In the end, using the Fibonacci hacks, if I'm not mistaken. Taken, right? Hmm. The Fibonacci Hex. Seriously, I don't know why we have to bring maths into this. I need a name for a spell. How about a mathematician? Y yeah, that'll do. Can't wait to see a Pythagoras death ray. Save the world. Wow. Then what'd you do? We all went out and got pissed. Well, if you knew this show was coming down the line, I can see why. But again, not exactly fantasy kingdom language, is it? Jog on, go get pissed. No, how very 21st century of you. And that thing that you did at the Slaughter of Lamb. You... Wait, what? You mean this? <laughs> you want him to do that to your friend? What, to cure him or annihilate his face off? Oh, you are full of bright ideas, aren't you, love? And blast his insides out. Exactly! Why was that even a suggestion? Did she not see what happened to him? Yeah, you know, my friend's ill, but if you could slowly get the skin to burn off his skull, maybe he'll get better. <laughs> the thing is, that's not even the most stupid idea she has in this episode, let alone anything else. A few moments of the most excruciating pain ever endured, probably followed by death. And that's just watching this episode. Well, 
could have just said no. Why did he need to say no when you saw people melt in front of your eyes? What did you think happened to the people in the last episode? That they just went over a hill and lived happily ever after? In pieces. This is all your fault. Wait, you're blaming him now? Oh, this ought to be good. You sent us on a wild goose chase to find some stupid artifact, and it doesn't even exist. No, but where he sent you on the wild goose chase to find the artifact is literally the location that every single person ended up at. Because that's where you're all meant to go. Him sending you on that wild goose chase made you get there first. I can't believe you made us waste so much time as we arrived in front of everybody. I just want like a Venn diagram of events because I don't think these people remember the order of things happening. And now we're trapped in some cursed castle. You're not trapped. You walked in there voluntarily and can leave whenever you want. It's not even dangerous outside. It's raining, not the end of the world. I live in the UK. Happens a lot. So time passes and the only person that seems to care about the future husband is the chef. I know it's an arranged marriage, but have you tried being slightly less of a cow for once? Borman is eating mystery meat, which is literally the setup for one joke. How long does he have before it takes hold? Not long. Sometime in the small hours of the night, he'll lose control. If that's the case, maybe don't have the most important person in the entire universe next to the guy who's about to turn evil. Why don't you replace her with his wife? She's not important at all. I mean, we all know it has to be done. Oh, you're just loving it, aren't you? <laughs> guy sneezes, you're like, off with his head! Oh, it had to be done, there was no other choice. I almost caught the sniffles. What was the last thing that Valentine asked you to do? Kill him. That doesn't mean you just do it for everybody. <laughs> don't know if you noticed, but that guy was already destroyed by the spell Willow cast on him, which also you suggested to use it on this guy as well. You seem to just want to really make this guy suffer for some reason. I mean, I know he's your fiance, but you could at least wait until you get married before you make his life a living hell. If the Prince of Galadon and Kit would be at war. Hester knew, right? We, we all knew that he never should have come. This is where Kit transfers over from just insufferable to pure evil. Look, Kit, you can't kill your husband because we'll be at war. Nothing about it being morally wrong, no. Only because we'll be at war. She's like, well, he shouldn't have come along anyway. He knew what was gonna happen. <laughs> Doesn't have a single moral bone in her body. And if I have to decide between saving Eric and waiting for Graydon to turn into some kind of monster. Then that's a price I'm willing to pay. <laughs> this show is meant to be watchable for kids. It's meant to be a family show and we've got this disaster. Hey, you should put that in your wedding vows. <laughs> After the little dwarf died, he's my favourite character. Kid's right. Don't tell her that. She's got a big enough head already, dude. I've had some experience with this before and I know I'm not strong enough to stop it. I don't want to hurt you guys. No one mentions that, by the way. No one questions it or anything. The fact that he literally said, Oh, I've had experience with demonic possession in the past. It's all normal. It's everyday occurrence. We've all done it. By the way, I know the language of the dead. If her highness is in such a hurry to see it done, she ought to do it herself. That is not the argument you think it is, love. You met Kit, she wanted to throw a dagger at her own brother's face. Of course she'll do it. The better tactic would have been shame and humiliation. At least she was trying to keep the respect of the stable hand. Oh, you don't think I will? No, no, I definitely think you will. You are an absolute nutcase, love. But in a last desperate hope, Alora asks Willow, there must be something that you can do. You're a really powerful sorcerer who can do one spell before falling over. Surely you know something. When she was young, your age, Avmorda was bright, curious, full of promise. Okay, but she asked if there's anything you can do. She didn't want story time. Yes, no, or give us an answer would normally be the thing, but instead, we launch it into an entirely long, unrelated story. He tells about how the evil sorceress used to be good until she got kidnapped by the worm. The order of the worm got into her mind and radicalized her. I mean, what was she doing looking at memes? Oh no, a frog! I was going to heal the world, but now I will rule it! Converting her with their warped beliefs and gifting her with unnatural powers. What kind of powers? Well, for example, she once changed the entire Galadorn army into pigs. I suppose there's a step up from frogs after all. Ah yeah, they have been eating pig, so um... Hey, don't worry about it, it's just a cheap laugh based off eating your own military. <laughs> it's a kid's show, it's fine, it's fine. It's Fun for all the family. It was chaos. Pigs everywhere. Sorry, all, all of them. Except the one, you know, in your mouth. You're throwing all the pigs back into people? I think so. Seriously, I'm amazed he didn't have a bottle of Chianti next to him. But at the end, we find out that his entire story was entirely pointless. And all he needed to say was, well, we're in a castle where an evil sorceress was. And so, she's probably got some magic upstairs in her spell book. Would have been a lot easier to say than a massive long story about pigs, don't you think? But they find a spell in the book that they think will cure him. All they've got to do is a bit of alchemy. Call it an introduction to alchemy. We're going to make a cell. Yeah, cream. Help me, I've been demonically possessed. Okay, 
Have you tried Savlon? Applied at the proper time while the purgation is read aloud and his fluids drained. What kind of fluids are you draining? Somebody get his wife. Seriously, I know his head was in your lap, but she wants to do him in already. If this is what's going to happen, then she should at least make it worth his while. Blood, pus, discharge. Definitely going to need his wife. For better, for worse. No second thought surprised me. I'm not sure any of those things would be better if you didn't know they were coming. Also, none of those things occur in the episode anyway, so I'm not really sure why they were mentioned. So they go around gathering ingredients and making the salve. Crode knows we're here. She'll send her gales to ensure the ritual is completed. We'll need to keep watch. Spoiler, no one is sent. <laughs> This whole episode doesn't have set off and pay off. It has an event and then like, why did that happen? I don't understand. We can't allow Graydon's infection to pass to any of us. If it does, we won't get out of here alive. Because we already know he's not going to get out of here alive. Don't you like how he looked at Kit when he said that? It's like, because if we get infected, she's going to have all of us. Get like a bit of soot on your hand. Ah, get him! <laughs> Thirsty, she really is. But for any of them to get possessed, they basically have to get the gunk on them. So basically, stay gunk free. The vermiscus goo. Don't sniff it, don't wipe it, don't eat it. Why would we eat it? Why would you sniff it? It's like I can understand. You get it on your hands, you don't notice, and you eat something. Away you go. But to go, oh, I'm going to snort that is a bit different, isn't it? That's like next level. There's one thing even more important than that. No matter what, stay out of the high tower. It's maybe, probably a portal to the netherworld. It may be, probably. I'm glad you're so knowledgeable about the topic. Also, the fact that you can, whatever you do, absolutely nobody under any scenario Go into the high tower. They're definitely going into the high tower, aren't they? Don't touch the evil goo. Stay out of the high tower. Everybody got that? So someone's touching the goo and then going to go in the high tower. Nailed it. So they start walking through the castle corridors, which I'm sure have absolutely no resemblance to the castle corridors from the first episode. Also, I've likened this show to CW before. And what you've got in this scene is feelings in hallways. Oh no, there's an event. I need to talk about it. To the hallway! I know you're hurting, but you can't keep punishing yourself for doing what you had to. Feelings! In a hallway! Kit, if I don't care about your feelings, how much do you think I will care about you telling somebody else what they feel? But they start whining about how she had to kill her mentor before. You know, the guy that literally nobody cared about because he was on screen for three seconds and then turned evil. And so when he died, I was like, well, he was evil anyway. I don't really care. It was just me, was it? I don't know. <laughs> I just think if you want me to care about a character passing, you've got to make me like him first. Not have him evil for 90% of the show. All I remember about being a kid is mucking stables and mending bridles and- Oh, please tell me more. I'm sure this is going to be an incredible story about mucking out stables. Besides, what do you mean the only thing you can remember as a kid? Every other baby in the show can remember directions through a forest and multiple other things. Like they've got a photographic memory of coming down the birth canal and you're like, I can't remember it until I was mucking out the stables. When did you do that? One month old? But she goes on and desperately tries to make us feel something about the character. He saved me. He gave me a reason to live. He believed in me when no one else would. He was in need of a quality night and he said, you know what? I need that little girl down in the stables. Maybe he was a good man. I just question his recruiting strategies. He gave me a sword and I killed him with it. Yeah, that was a bit of a mistake, wasn't it? I mean, to be fair, he did ask. Because when you say it that way, you make it sound like he just gave it you and you slipped. I know. She knows you know. You were there! The better question is, why are you telling me this? I was there and watched you do it! Just help Willow and Allura gather what they need. Yeah, splitting up in the evil castle is definitely something that won't come back to bite us all in the ass. That's what's that, something we should always do in the horror episode. Split up at the first opportunity. Now Borman is off wandering around the castle. I don't know why. He does, however, steal some wine off the skeleton, which honestly, if I had to star in this role, I don't blame him at all. It's got to be difficult carrying the show on your back. But as he walks around, he finds a golden vault. I know what you're thinking. Ooh, what's in there? And so am I, because I've watched this episode and I still have no idea. I know that's just a wall on a set, but I didn't expect the show to treat it like that and never go past it. Either way, he gets very interested in it. Oh, hello, lovely. What treasures are you hiding? Literally nothing. But he goes up to the door, sees the extremely traditional locking mechanism, and decides to pull out his picks. I mean, they're meant to be picks, but there's absolutely no way that that is a pick. That's a key at best. The thing is, I know they're meant to be picks because he shoves another one in there as if he's using lock picks. Look, I've watched enough of the lock picking lawyer to know that that would not work. There's also a rather weird soundtrack going on in the background during all of this. All right, calm down. I think we're getting interference from Kit and the Stable Hands private videotape. But they've gathered all the ingredients except for one, Essence of Nightshade. Because nothing can ever go easy and we've got to invent arbitrary problems just to last out the entire episode. And so we get some very weird twist of fate. We can't leave out ingredients. Mix it wrong, we could blow up the whole castle. It's okay, dude. I don't think you're going to blow up the castle because you left out Nightshade. Brain, parson bladder. Parson's eat nothing but Nightshade. 
Yeah. She, like, because they eat nothing but nightshade in their bladder, we'll be able to get essence of nightshade from that. And I'm like, so you don't want to leave out ingredients because it might blow everything up, but you're willing to add a bladder into it. Oh, adding stuff is fine, though, even though we're going against the recipe. Okay, this magic stuff must be more flexible than I thought. Cook down its spleen and voila, essence of. Is that what you put in your muffins? I mean, at least she's got muffins. What do you have? A chip on your shoulder? I mean, I don't think there's really much comparison if we really are just on about innate attraction between the two of you. Among other things. Can you just go and check if they have any? You think that's something people just have in their cupboards? I don't know. I mean, we're trying to save a man's life. So if you could please go back to the pantry where you've already gone to gather ingredients ingredients and do something for somebody else once in your sad little life, then maybe, just maybe, people might be able to stand a second in your company. Oh, I'm sorry, he's going to talk for Nightshade. Too much for someone of your self-importance. <laughs> As he chokes on the floor. Okay, what are you doing with those, mate? Whoa, 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 hey, hey, come on. Relax. I'm just gonna cut him off, it's fine. You're not gonna need him when you're a zombie anyway. <laughs> Okay, dude, where are you shoving them? I was taking the piss, but this is going a bit far. Judging by that face, he's already gone and done it. He uses the scissors to cut his shirt off because Willow hasn't learned about buttons yet and finds all his chest is massively scarred. Is that part of... No. Yeah, he was sick as a kid and no one's supposed to know what that means, despite the fact that he's already said, I've had experience of demonic possession before. The show really does spell out the supposed mystery for you in this. But with that, they start to go through the process of removing the demon. Cut to Little Miss Muffet's in the storage room, which you're going to be seeing a lot of this episode, and she can't find it. Go ahead, kid. Fetch me some brown possum butter. Sprinkle it on my bum and make my gentle wind smell like cinnamon. I don't think that's quite what she asked, although I'm really not surprised that's where your brain went first. But with that, Borman arrives, who's also looking for something. Hi. Hello. You didn't find any eel jelly or nymph butter, did you? Eel jelly or nymph butter? After we've just heard you getting calls through a locked door, what are you looking for? Lubricant? What was on the other side of the safe, dude? Um, aren't you supposed to be watching out for the gales? Watching out for somebody, all right, by the sound of it. There's this door that I found that uh, looks like a great spot for lubricant. Watching. With lubricants. I don't think he ever got through the door, but he's really making it sound like he gets through. Unless for some reason they think you need jelly or butter to pick a lock. Woman, are you plundering my dead grandma's castle? I mean, she was getting on. I'm sure a lot of people had plundered her castle. No, of course not. I don't care if you are. Okay, in that case, 100% yes. See, so he hasn't got through the door, which means the woman calling out to him that he heard, he hasn't met her yet inside there or anything. So why does he need the eel butter? But he talks about how most people think this castle is cursed which absolutely isn't foreboding for anything happening in the future of the episode. So she gives him his eel jelly. It's not gonna work. And if this ritual doesn't kill him, I don't have to jump to that. It's the first conclusion of literally everything. Oh, I can't find some possum bladder. Guess I'm just gonna have to cut his face off. Seriously, what are you, Canadian? It's not even that big a storage place. Can you just please look at the shelves first? Be very proud of her granddaughter right now. Yes, the evil sorceress would be so proud that you're trying to off your friends for literally no reason at all. Mind you, she did fail through her own incompetence, so at least we know where you got it from. But after the conversation, she finds the possum right in front of her all along. She was just too busy fantasizing about what she was about to do to him to find it. Bassog, Tarong. Back with the people doing the spell, which actually doesn't seem to be doing anything. Uh, Elora, this won't work if you don't say it with me. Yes, Elora. Could you please stop staring at me when you're the person who's supposed to be doing all of the magic? Why do you think you're here to sit next to him and look pretty? No, you're supposed to be the most powerful sorceress to have ever lived, dear. Say the words. Gashog, Bashog, Tarong, Amok. Amok. Seriously, even when he's barely alive, there's always someone here to correct your pronunciation. So they start to read out the incantation. Yeah, you hold on to that iron chain willow. I mean, he was going to escape, but now you're holding on to it. So there's absolutely no possibility of that. Maybe overestimating your strength there a little bit, don't you think? This is a guy who couldn't even walk across a flat floor at the start of the episode. But as they're chanting, he sees a vision of his father. You're such a failure. Give Galadorn an heir with a claim to Tirasleen. Redeem yourself from what you stole from me. Yes, it seems like his father isn't particularly happy with him because we got an image of his brother. And I'll catch you if you fall. It's desperately trying to make you care about his backstory, but because nobody cares about his character in the first place, why would I care about his past? And it was the writers that made him boring. 
They stripped him of anything even slightly masculine, any kind of personality trait possible, all so they could make him completely safe and non-threatening, all because you wanted the princess to seem incredibly strong next to him, and, oh, isn't she so hard done by because she's going to have to marry this mouse. They were your words. And so you wrote a character that basically doesn't exist in his own right. He's just a body taking up space. And now suddenly I'm supposed to care about his previous history. Now, unfortunately, you can't have it both ways. And if you wanted me to care about him, you probably should have made him a person. But Kit is on the way back with her possum. She keeps hearing whispers all over the place, but doesn't even seem to think that's weird. <laughs> if I'm walking down a corridor and suddenly... Blah, 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 I'd speed up! But she walks down a corridor, and then when she turns around, there's a painting there. Do you renounce your name? Your family? I mean, yes, basically. She hates her mother, tried to lob a dagger in her brother's face, and she wants to kill her husband. That's everyone related to her, so yes. But she sees images of the previous evil sorcerer, and then in the background, she sees her on the painting. Dun dun da. Oh no, I'm destined to be evil too. Don't worry, love, you already are. But then, because she's entirely incompetent at everything she ever tries to do, we get this. You shall be his harbinger. Yeah, that's right. She leant too close to the painting and set it on fire with her torch. I'm not being funny, love, but this is meant to be a medieval world. How do you not know what an open flame does? So she drops the possum. I don't know why that's in the show, because it doesn't affect the storyline at all. And finds out that as the painting burns. Oh, look, the corridor that I just walked down is a corridor again. So she picks up the possum and then heads off back down it. You know, the same corridor that she's just come from. Walked down a corridor, did a 180 and came back in the same place. Where do you think you're going? You're supposed to be going back to Willow, you crazy. Never mind. Never mind. This is why if you have a castle like this, you should probably draw a map so that things like that make sense. Meanwhile, stable hands on top of the castle wall. I'm trying to get this damn treasure vault open and, and it's killing me. I really need to know what's in there. You know, what if it's something really good, like a, a giant gold statue of, a, of an eagle? How are you going to get a giant gold statue home? You're supposed to be going and saving the brother. What are you going to do with the statue, mate? Kid's right, you know. One of us is going to have to kill him. Probably. And it's going to have to be either you or me. Yeah. I have never seen so many people so desperate to kill a guy who's done nothing to you. He's done basically nothing the entire series, and yet it was like, please, can I do it? With friends like these, who needs enemies? We have a heart to heart about how she can cope with what she had to do at the end of the last episode, and how Bannatine wouldn't have wanted her to lie to herself, and she just focus on the future. And then we get this. Seriously, with expressions like that, that's why I think he's the best character in the series. Oh my god, what's she doing? Alright, that's... <clears throat> Everyone deserves one good cry per quest. Okay, I can't wait for yours then, mate. What's yours gonna be on not being able to open the vault? Also, during this scene, it kind of hints that he thought the vault was up here, you know? on the wall for some reason, and that maybe the wide had made him hallucinate and turn him round, when really it just seems like the castle is so haunted, people keep getting turned around all over the place. So the chef is gutting the possum, and little Miss Queasy over here can barely handle it. Look, if you're gonna get grossed out, can you just take a few steps back, please? I mean, on the one hand, go Alora. On the other hand, this is someone that's actually stabbed people with a sword before. I don't know why she's getting affected by a possum. I know they're all royalty and such, but I always got the impression that in like a medieval world, everybody would have engaged in some kind of hunting and stuff to get food. And this would have just been something that you would have seen naturally. It's not like they can go and nip to Asda for a pre-prepared steak. <laughs> okay, still second favourite class. Anything that knocks Kit down a peg or two is good in my book. So she pulls out its bladder and for some reason decides to cook it first. I thought we wanted what was inside it, but apparently no. What we actually wanted it to be was... Kind of medium rare. So she starts rubbing it around the pan. Laura, quickly. What do you expect her to do, mate? Look, I've got to sear the steak on both sides for a set amount of time. I don't know if you've realized this, but I don't actually control the power of heat. I don't care how hungry you are, I can't make it go any faster. Regardless of that, she decides to pick it up because, you know, now it's not so important to cook it first or anything. We'll get this weird scene where she adds it to the poultice. Maybe he won't even feel it. Well, that was underwhelming. Maybe he won't even feel it. Oh, he didn't even feel it. Does that mean it's working or that it's failed? I really don't know. But they start chanting again and suddenly his eyes open and everything changes it seems like they made it worse can anyone hear me if you can please talk to me her brother starts to speak through him or at least you know something pretending to be her brother anyway i'm scared we're coming for you not egg please it's the lich stop. he's trying to break her concentration okay then maybe don't let him why are you having a conversation about it just keep on saying the spell so kit runs off because she's got the stomach of a well a princess Yogg And they continue the spell. You shouldn't be doing this, Nana. You should know how it ends. That's right. Now his daughter has jumped into a body, supposedly, and starts complaining at him. You can't protect her. Shut up! Tell her the truth. Tell her everything or I Shut up, I say! But as she's telling him, you need to tell her what's going on, he decides to shove a gag in her mouth. 
I'm sure that's not suspicious at all. Also, if we know that this guy was possessed by demons and he was going to try and disrupt your conversation, maybe gagging him first would have been a good idea. I don't know. It's almost like you should have known these things. But despite the fact that they're supposed to be casting a spell to save a man's life, she can't worry about anything but herself. What does that mean? Yeah, why would you actually care about him, right? Couldn't just do the spell first, cure him, and then ask the questions? Oh no, maybe we should just let him die, because then at least I'll know what's happening to me. Focus! Thank you! Is there something Attack that you're not telling me? me? Probably, but if we sit here and discuss everything that you're not aware of in the world, we may be here a while. It doesn't matter! What happened to your village? It doesn't matter what happened to his village. A man is dying in front of you, and you're like, oh, please, can I have your entire life story? Why don't you just tell me about your famous pop band and just let that guy slowly get inhabited by a demon? Priorities, dear. Listen, if you can't be of any use, leave. Uh, that's not the rest response either, though, is it? Especially if she walks out. If she walks out now, she does not care about that man's life at all. After all the, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, Kit, I don't know why you're doing this. This is a pivotal moment to find out just how much she cares. Does she care about more about his life or finding out what happened? to Willow's Village 20 years ago. And she walks off. Oh, how much I can pretend to care about your life, right up until the fact someone won't tell me what happened to their village. Whatever it was couldn't have been that bad because you met their village and he was voted the leader of it. But you don't get every single answer that you want and so you're willing to let a man die because of it. Oh. What a moral group of heroes this is. And she's meant to be the best person out of the group. She's meant to be the savior of the world. And she's evil. So much for being my second favorite character, I guess. It's time to pull out the big guns. A hat rack. Oh, Miss Money Penny, you've never seen me like this before. Try to relax. Try and relax as I beat you with a hat rack. Back with more, and he's still trying to get into the lock. <laughs> For some reason, and no, I don't know why, this time he has lubed up his hands. His hands aren't going in the lock. I don't know why putting jelly on them will improve his use of the lock picks, but apparently that's what happens in this universe. Ah, fiddlesticks! Yes, I can't imagine why your lock picks covered in jelly don't do anything. Fiddlesticks! I hate you all! That sounds like something like a Skyrim. Was that your own version of Fusru Da? I hate you all! Maybe if you level up a bit first and come back later, you can get in. But again, the voice keeps calling out to him. Oh and he doesn't seem to have learned his lesson. He's not even seen it yet. And you know, voices, faces. It's not always a perfect match. But this is a time before the internet, and so I can understand him not learning that lesson yet. She took the last. But it whispers to him, tempting him, she took it, she took it. And he's like, oh, oh no, it's gone. The key has gone. You know, the key that nobody else knew about or even knew he had. Yes, apparently they've taken it despite this fact. I mean, personally, if I was a thing that could control minds and I was locked in a vault, I'd be trying to get him to open the vault. But apparently, no. We're more than happy just to cause a bit of trouble for him. But either way, he falls for it, forgets that he wants to get into the treasure vault, and goes off looking for his key. He sees two arrows in the wall, which is supposed to remind him of Kit and make him think that Kit stole it. Of course, for anyone that's watched the show, this doesn't make any sense, as everyone knows that Kit only has four arrows, and she's still got four arrows, because she doesn't fire a bow at any point in the entire thing. That's one of my pet peeves about the show, and you're like, oh yeah, it's her trademark weapon. You know, the weapon that she never uses. Those aliens. I still don't know what he said here. I think he says, those aliens. Those aliens. And I mean, I'm up for talking bad about him as much as the next guy, but don't you think that's taking it a bit far? But Laura and Kit are talking about the woodcutters and how I can't save everybody because they still would have been alive if I'd never met them. But then, just as she's about to reveal that actually, you made a tree and you can do magic and you're amazing after all, she hears a voice and goes to in search of it. But just as Kit goes to follow Laura. Wait, wait, I'll come with you. Yeah, Laura's vanished again. I mean, seriously, it happens at every episode. At what point are we just going to tie ourselves to her? You can't keep losing her. But the stable hand's walking through the castle, and she sees these sort of ghosts appear, one of which is her mother. And at that point, a ghost of a warrior appears, which she decides to fight. Now, I don't know about anyone else, but if a ghost of my past turned up, firstly, I probably wouldn't fight it. I'd try and escape. But secondly, I definitely think that this was weird enough to tell people about later. Not in this show, no, no. It's all perfectly normal whenever... We're never going to speak about this again. So they have a fight, and she escapes from him, diving into the nearest room, which happens to be the storage closet. I did tell you we'd be in this room a lot. <laughs> Some people say it's because there's a spell on a castle which is moving all of the rooms, so they all connect to this as a central hub. Other people say it's because we're trying to save money on set. But Alora goes exploring in search of the voice, and she hears this speech from her mother at the start of the first movie about how my baby will come back and get you. She will come back and 
Silence, you won't finish you! Silence, Frank! Frank, I won't finish you! There's lots of these sort of ghostly apparitions with lots of smoke around them in this episode, which are all done from scenes in the first movie. And the thing is, they're pretty well done for an idea to integrate the original movie into this series. It's as good an idea as any. The smoke definitely allows for some element of cover over the sort of dodgy CGI method of doing it. And I think if you're going to aim to pull on the nostalgia strings, then this is as good a mean as anything else in order to get it into your show. My issue is, why do you just keep including the movie in your TV series? None of this adds to the episode, it doesn't form into the story of the episode in any way, shape or form and contribute to it. Instead, it's just like a recap from the movie in case you haven't seen it. What's the point? Just go and watch the movie! Mother? Yeah, we did have to put the camera from her perspective because it's easier to do a voiceover than it would be to, you know, CGI a mouth moving. Oh, she's grown up fierce and resilient. I mean, if you look at her and you see fierce and resilient, then, uh, where? Now, if I did need someone for a marathon day of making muffins, then she's your girl, but fierce is, is no. But then obviously her mother ends in the same sharp, sudden way that she did in the movie. Ah, yes, this scene, the most stupid scene in the episode, where she spends her time barricading a door. She senses that there's someone else in the room. <laughs> yeah, the show tries to do a little bit of jump scares in this episode. But don't worry, it's Kit. Now, Kit does go bump in the night, but when it comes to Stable Girl, she considers that a good thing. How did you get here? Through the door? What? Just spend the last half an hour barricading the door. So there's probably something dodgy about the castle then, yeah? We all agreed? I want everyone to remember she spent the last half an hour barricading the door. This is a knight, a member of the military. Surely she can barricade a door to the point where someone can't get through it. Otherwise, what use is she? Seriously. There's definitely something very wrong with this castle. And the people inside it. Oh, the spiral staircase just tried to eat me. So you came to the stable hand. Who also wants to eat you. This just isn't your day, is it? But at that point, they hear a banging on the door, which makes a change from the banging on their headboard. <laughs> they decide that to stop the person knocking on the door, they're going to gently push against the barricade that she spent half an hour building. Yes, I'm sure your combined 20 stone will really make the difference here. We have swords and crossbows and spiked flails with poison. If I had a poison flail, I'd be more concerned about hitting myself with it as the ball came back around myself. Wow, okay, I surrender. Now let me in. That's right, it's more. Nothing to worry about. Well, as long as it is more, and they've got a very cunning idea of how to work out he's actually him. Tell us something only the real Borman would know. Okay, you two have totally got the hearts for each other. How would only the real him know that? That was something the show was desperate for us to know three seconds into the episode. It's not as if you hide it. You even dance together at Royal Court. I think everybody knows. What other impossible question do you want him to answer? Whether you're into astrology? But they decide to let him in because obviously that's proof. Uh, the issue is, they've spent the last half an hour barricading the door. What are you gonna do? Spend half an hour moving all of the stuff out of the way so he can get in? No, they just walk off and turn around as if, oh yeah, now you can just get through the door, right? The barricaded door? We don't. Yeah, oh. Now you're just taking the piss. What was the point of barricading the door if one normal-sized man can just push it open? And when I said that their combined 20 stone can't have been the only thing stopping something coming from that door, it turns out, no, actually it was. Because the moment the two powerful, empowered people leave the door, suddenly the door could just be opened. All of that stuff in the way is nothing compared to the power of their combined arses. Well, oh, people don't spend time squatting for nothing. Block a door with it, it might save your life. Where is it? Yeah, that is the other downside of it. He still thinks that you've stolen his key. Maybe letting him in wasn't the best idea. The only one in the catacombs for me, that means you're the only one who could have guessed I had it. So he's sure she's stolen the key, despite the fact that, uh, he did tell her that he didn't have a key in the first place, so how on earth she's supposed to have stolen something that she didn't know existed, I don't know. Logic isn't the show's strong point already, so when they want to work out that a character has been tricked, you have to go into double nonsensical logic territory. Everything has to compound. The Lux Arcana! Yes, the Lux Arcana, because we don't want to say, it's a key! You have no idea what it means to me and what I would do to get it back. <laughs> now that was a good little move though, although I have a feeling that, you know, if someone has a sword and they just go like that on your neck, then you're, you, you're probably not going to have much of a neck left. But uh, apparently, no, he's fine. Please remove your grubby hands from my princess. I mean, you can say a lot of things, but I don't think his hands are that grubby. Covered in eel jelly, maybe, but if anything, that will have cleaned him. Uh. So then they both draw their swords and the tables have turned. And I have to say, 
She looks remarkably pleased about it. I don't know what she's doing with her eyes in that expression, but uh, it doesn't really look like I'm going to stab you with this thing. If anything, it's more, will you please stab me with your thing? All I'm saying are those are two very, very different expressions. But Alora comes back to find a mess, and he's escaped. Everything's been broken, all the things he was tied to, now he's no longer chained to them. And for some reason, she doesn't see that as a bad sign. What, what happened? Where's Willow? Gone. The ritual, it, it worked. He was able to draw the poison out of me, but somehow it got into him, and now he's the lich. She just believes it. No, I'm not kidding. She just believes it. You're like, oh, she must know, and she's just going along with it because she knows she's in danger. But if she goes along with it, then maybe she can find some kind of weakness in his plan or something to actually turn it around on him as if, haha, and you'll look. No, no, she's just that thick. This might be the most obvious twist in a TV series that everyone can see coming, and the only way you can pass it off is by making Alora the thickest person on Earth. You're okay. Yeah. But he's like, oh, Willow's definitely not okay, though. Let's go and save Willow. It's definitely Willow that's in trouble. Willow! Willow! Yeah, I mean, even according to your story, he's been possessed by an evil demon, so calling his name will definitely help. What do you expect the demon to do? Play Marco Polo with you? But the guy who's definitely not a demon suddenly has a plan. I think I know where he may have gone. We have to think like he would. Not Willow, the Lich. Where would he go? The High Tower. Yes, let's go to the High Tower, the doorway. You know, the only place in the entire thing we've been told not to go. We definitely need to go over there. Can we not think like the leash and then follow his plan? I'll go. It's not safe for you. No. No, it really isn't. Stay down here. If he dies, it's not that much of a loss for the series, is it? But then if you wanted a quality line, oh boy, are you about to get a quality line? You have never seen script writing of this quality before. That's to be seen or rather heard to be believed. Willow saved my life. It's my turn to save his. How do you know where to go? I was born here. That's a line so magnificent. I think you need to hear it twice for it to properly sink in. How do you know where to go? I was born here. Well, I was born here. Of course I know where to go. You know, I was at least one month old when I got ejected from the castle. I have a perfect memory of its entire layout. Babies don't have memories. At least if you were a toddler, we could have gone while he walks around a bit, but you were in a cage, in a dungeon, and suddenly you're supposed to have a layout of the entire castle, including the high tower, which is literally the home of the evil sorceress. What was a one month old baby doing waddling around the evil sorceress's tower? And in fact, it's even more stupid than that. You were captured from outside the castle, brought into the dungeon, and kept in a cage. Yes, you were born here, but you never traveled anywhere. Just because you're born in a region doesn't mean that somehow magically you get all the knowledge of the area. Oh, I was born in Manchester, and that means I know the best location for fish and chips across the entire city. And this is the second time you've done this. In the second episode, Willow found you because you'd managed to navigate through a forest to a river that you'd only floated down as a baby as well. You're supposed to be a sorceress, not a GPS. <laughs> The only thing worse than the stupid lines we've just had is the impressive music they did afterwards because they're so pleased with themselves about that line. They genuinely thought that was magnificent enough to be worthy of this. I was born here. This show has no idea when to play dramatic music. If it was meant to make this moment magnificent, it didn't because I was too busy wetting myself and then going to tweet about it. So they travel up the tower and I don't know, this scene seems like it could either go very wrongly or very well. But they have a discussion about the key. He wants it back and she's like, well, you never told me you even had it. You lied to me. How do you expect me to steal something which I didn't even know you had because you told me you didn't have it? Yes. Well, I may have lied about that, which is irrelevant because you liars are the only two people I've been intimately close to since I had it. I am not surprised they give each other that look. Didn't know the old dog had it in him. When were you intimately close with Borman? When were you? At least we know it's an option now. The show's looking up after all. <sighs> it's, a, it's an Ockmar trying to get in our heads and pin us against each other. But at that point, they noticed that Alora has gone up the only tower everyone was told not to go up. So we've probably got bigger issues. So they arrive where the finale of the movie took place. I can't help you anymore. Oh yeah, the most obvious twist of the series just happened. The only person surprised by this is her. Oh no! So she tries to escape and the doors just magically close on her. And at this point, the leash just wants to complete the spell that the sorceress was trying to do at the end of the movie. And so we're going to replay that scene all over again, apparently. Oh, the member berries. But because this show isn't cliche enough, we decided to add one more. I know you're in there, Grey. And I know some part of you can hear me. I know you're good deep down. Why don't you just fight it? Oh, I long for the days when evil people were just 
evil. But at that point, Willow arrives, ready to do his disappearing pig trick. What did I say was the number one most important safety rule? No matter what, stay out of the high tower. <laughs> Next time, maybe obey it. Cut the episode down by 10 minutes. Do us all a favor. You are the worst apprentice ever. To be fair, he's not wrong there. She doesn't even know she can do magic yet. But the leash engages in complicated magic and turns her into a ballerina. He starts casting a spell with her hair, preparing her to get eradicated into the void. And the leash exposes Willow. Actually, he didn't defeat her by being a great sorcerer. Instead, he just did a disappearing pig trick and she fell over. We get a ghostly apparition from the movie of exactly those events happening because just assumes nobody saw the movie. <laughs> and when we get to see where she knocked over her own potion and got hit by lightning. I have to admit, even in the movie, it was a stupid ending, but it was a family film and you're kind of, okay, what exactly could they have done to her to make it have such a gruesome ending? You didn't need to show it twice though. She was thwarted by her own carelessness. Yeah, I mean, that was the time of the 80s. Back in the 80s, women could be careless too. But he uses his magic on her again and, uh, she seems to have an amazing time. A really amazing time. Second time in the series this has happened. She's just, I don't know, she's either really easily pleased or is in for a treat. Clearly dark magic has a wonderful effect on people. Really wonderful effect on people. I'm not even sure if this is the same shot that we had before because it looks eerily similar to what I've seen before. This exact pose. But he starts lifting her up to the sky. How will you defeat us? Same as last time. With my friends. Probably the best moment of the episode, although I do kind of think it's undercut when the actual characters appear. I like the whole ghostly element of the traditional cast going through, and then they burst through, and you're like, oh, oh, oh yeah, it's it's modernity in it. But they contribute great effect by giving Willow his staff back, which he promptly uses to make him fly against the wall. I'm not being funny, but if the only thing your friends contribute is throwing you a staff. Can we really say they even helped? You could have just walked across. So he collapses because, oh no, I did a tiny bit of magic. She kind of falls unconscious and the leash is looking worse for wear. Yeah. Probably a bit more worse for wear after getting repeatedly punched in the face by Borman. Then Willow gets jumped <laughs> by some little tiny midget stone creature. Literally no one in the room cares that he gets jumped by an evil minion of darkness. They just leave him there to suffer. Because she wakes up and Borman's like, we have to, now's our opportunity. We have to get rid of him now. <laughs> wait, wait. Oh yeah, maybe I should ask our sorceress if she can actually cure the person. Nobody thought of doing that before. Or maybe we should make herself, or we could just get her to do it because she is the most powerful sorceress in the world. You can't help her, but you can help Graydon. Maybe you should have just told her this before. Because this is where she goes, actually, you do realize you are a sorceress. I know you think you're not, and I know everyone else thinks you're not, but I'm the only person in the party that knew you grew a tree, and I just haven't told you you were magic for some reason all this time. Oh yeah, because I'm jealous and a complete cow. That'll be why. You can still save him. Don't go to the Elberry bush. <laughs> it worked. I saw it in the woods. It was, it was beautiful. It was a plant. I'm sure one plant looks very much like another plant. It's got nothing to do with her. That's just how the plant looks. Use whatever it is you got to save Graydon. Because if you don't, you're going to regret it. So no pressure. By the way, you're magic. And if you don't save him, it's all your fault. And you'll regret it for the rest of your life. Go on now. I'm sure you'll perform well under that stress. For the rest of your life. Oh, just keep piling it on you. Yeah. yeah, performance anxiety. I'm sure that'll only make her better at magic. I don't know how. Yes, you do. Throw out the recipe. Damn it, Laura, don't you dare! Yes, this is Willow getting choked by an evil midget stone demon, and everyone's like, yeah, just leave him. I mean, he's only getting grabbed and choked by it. Doesn't matter. We'll just leave him in the corner with the monster. <laughs> There's plenty of people in this room. They don't all need to be standing around doing nothing. One of them could just walk over and save him, and instead of like, oh, just, you'll be fine. I know you needed a reason to stop Willow actually stopping you, but somebody else in the room should care about this. <laughs> <laughs> just leave him there. They all know. It's like they're looking at him and like, yeah, I know. He's getting attacked by stone. It's normal. Happens all the time. <laughs> and she doesn't care. And looks over and looks back. He'll be okay. He's magic. So then she goes forth and attempts to do magic that she has no idea about what to do and has never learned. We get a rather um close scene between them. 
where she sucks his soul out. And she has no idea what she's doing, so for a first time, that's impressive performance. But she gets a quick flashback, except it's not her flashback. It's him and his brother, and he looks at his brother, who too has the evil possessed eyes, who drags him out of a tree. So we can probably put the rest of the story together, that essentially, he probably had to get rid of his brother, which is why his father blames him for everything. And that's how he knows, like, the language of the dead, because he was trying to cure his brother. He put a lot of work into it, became a bit of a bookworm. And in the end, he didn't make it, and his father has always blamed him, despite the fact that he tried to save his life. It's an incredible, predictable story. I don't think it's that interesting of a story, and it certainly doesn't save a character like this who has zero personality. But oh well, flashback over, it lasted about three seconds. Kind of what you expect for a first time. And then the evil soul is just kind of ejected through the roof. So he's saved and extremely grateful to it. It's obvious that they want the two of those to get together, which is meant to cause friction because he's meant to be married to the other person. But as both of them hate each other, I really don't see where the tension's coming from. Somehow, when the evil demon went through the roof, Willow escaped from the stone minion. It doesn't explain how or why, and nobody saved him. Don't worry, we cut to another scene now. Forget what happened in the last one. You're not supposed to think about that anymore. It's in the past. Leave it alone. We're progressing forwards here. We don't have to make sense. We're just constantly moving forwards. So they leave the castle, and Borman finds, actually, it was never missing all along. I had the key right here, and it was never stolen from me. It was just some mystical voice in a vault that we never even went into that told me it was missing, and I thought it was. What's in that vault? Who was the person that caused him to believe that? I don't know. We'll never find out. Quick check in, just see how we're doing on the tally. Yep, still got those four arrows in the quiver with the bow over our shoulder. Four episodes, lots of fights. Never fired an arrow or even pulled the bow back at any point. At this point, I'm kind of thinking that the arrows are glued into her quiver so that they don't cause a problem as she's jumping around. I'm not even sure if she knows how to fire a bow because we've never even seen her pull the string back. I have to ask, why does she even have a bow to begin with? If she's never going to use it, you could have just sent her out with a sword. But just as they think they're safe, it turns out they're being watched. The minions were sent after him. It's just that they turned up at the end of the episode rather than at any time when they could have been useful. I mean, at this point, you're watching them go. Why don't you just attack them now? It'd be easy. But it's not over yet. We've got a little scene with the brother. He wakes up in a cage, set the doors open. How has he been transported here and still been unconscious the entire way, even though it's on the other side of the world? What's he been eating? Who's been feeding him? Has he been asked any questions? We don't don't know anything. So he goes out and leaves his cage very warily. It doesn't seem like he knows where he is, which implies he's been unconscious until he got here. He goes outside and there's just ash falling all over the place. A ton of ash. And as he stands on a high point and looks out to survey his territory, he sees a massive destroyed city with no one around him. How's he going to eat? How's he going to drink? How's he going to survive? How did he get there? Why is he being unconscious the entire way there? Are we just gonna go, it was magic, bruv? I don't know, but I kind of feel like somebody should have some answers at this point. And answers is all I want from this episode. Like, why did this episode exist? What was the point of it? We finished the episode at the same place as we started the episode. Oh, look, we're at a castle. Now we're leaving the castle. Okay, but nothing that happened during that entire time actually progressed the story in any way, shape, or form. We didn't really learn more about the characters in any way, shape, or form. She learned that she actually is a sorceress, which we already knew from the previous episode. And of the things that could have been interesting, you never even mentioned, and you just cut away from them because it was a problem you couldn't solve. I'm going to make a big deal about a guy, an entire storyline, about a guy trying to break into a vault. A vault where someone on the inside of that vault makes him do something. What does she do? Does she make him break her out? No, she just goes, oh yeah, you know that key, bruv? It, it's vanished now. And then the moment he leaves, it comes back. The woman's still trapped in the vault. Not exactly the best person for mind control, is it? We never did find out what was in the vault. He never saw inside. He looked through, but we, you know, why do you need to know that information? That's not useful. As well as the most obvious twist in the world of everyone knew that was the leash. And are we get never going to find out how he escaped how Willow survived? Why did Willow leave him to escape and then find him in the tower? Why has no one said what happened in that room? Because once again, it's the common problem of Willow, that any time they write themselves into a corner or write themselves into something which is difficult to describe, we ignore it and we just move on to the next scene. You don't want to know that answer. Trust us. If we explained it, it'll be way worse than any explanation you've come up with yourself. And on that, I do agree they're probably correct. And I can only go off the quality of their story that we did get for that kind of analysis. <laughs> Maybe this is a show where most things are best left up to headcanon, because what you don't want is them to write any more than they already have. But those are just my thoughts, what are yours? Let me know down in the comments below, like the video if you liked the video, subscribe, more videos like this in the future, and I will see you in the next one.
Bye-bye.